Hello, I'm Daniel Watson, pastor of First Assembly of God in Howell, Oklahoma. We are a local church with a worldwide vision of reaching out to people with the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. For the next few minutes, we want to reach out to you through the messages preached in this broadcast. As you watch this message, we pray that God will speak to your heart and that your life will be forever changed by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. If you have your Bible tonight, turn with me to the book of Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. This is our seventh week in our study on the book of Revelation. We're talking about the apocalypse of Revelation. Two weeks ago when we were uh, studying from the book of Revelation, we talked about uh, the, the first part of the tribulation. The rapture had taken place. We see in Revelation chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4 that it's messages to the church. And then all of a sudden in Revelation chapter 5, we're standing around the throne of God. In Revelation chapter 6, God holds in His right hand a scroll sealed with seven seals. We talked about the first six seals, and that brings us to where we are in Revelation chapter 7. In the book of Daniel, it also mentions uh, a, a peace covenant that's going to take place among Israel. And I told you two weeks ago that uh, this peace treaty, there is a treaty drafted by our own uh, presidential administration that has not yet truly been released to the public at this time. But in August of 2018, it had been known to the Jerusalem Post, and I have an article here, I'll read part of this here in just a moment, uh, concerning a peace treaty about the nation of Israel, concerning the lands and the Palestinians, and who receives the land and who does not. Uh, I mentioned to that to you two weeks ago. And on Monday and Tuesday, after we had talked about that, the same peace treaty come up in the news again. And Israel has already been presented with their portion of this peace treaty. And nothing yet has been uh, brought to pass from it as of yet. The Palestinians and our news media would have you to believe that all this peace treaty is going to do is, to is cause total chaos. But what we need to understand is the land of Israel belongs to the Jewish people. Amen. It was given to them by God Himself. He designed the borders. It's His land to give to His people. In this article from August 9, 2018 in the Jerusalem Post, it's talking about Trump's Israeli-Palestinian peace plan. It says U.S. President Donald Trump's plan for Israeli-Palestinian peace may be the closely guarded policy secret in Washington these days. 18 months in the making and yet still known only to a small handful of men behind it. Senior administration officials describe the plan as detailed, pragmatic, and essentially complete. All that prevents them from publishing it is their sense that the timing is off. Can you imagine that? They're waiting for some ripe moment. And I believe that ripe moment is when the rapture of the church takes place and the saints of God are out of here and this world is going to be in total chaos. What a better time to present a peace treaty to the world regarding the land of Israel. There are reasons to believe that they are right concerning that there is no mention to a Palestinian governing there is no mention of a Palestinian capital. While the White House insists that its recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital does not predetermine sovereignty over the entire city in an eventual peace agreement, it is never explicitly stated, as it did with Israel in December, that Palestinians have a reciprocal right to the capital in the holy city or to any capital of all. They have removed all reference to a two-state solution to Palestinian independence or Palestinian territories from State Department language, dismissing those terms as meaningless without yet spelling out alternatives. 
and they have defunded the UN Relief and Works Agency, characterizing the Palestinian aid organization as a corrupt and inefficient body perpetuating a false narrative on refugees unhelpful to the pursuit of peace. The article goes on to tell about when this peace plan will be presented. There is one new sign the administration is working on a rollout with direction and purpose. The Associated Press reported last week, keep in mind this was reported in August of 2018, reported that the peace team had begun staffing up on loading officials from the State Department and National Security Council to create working groups on the policy dimensions of the plan, the economic components of the plan, and the strategic sale of the plan to the public. The formation of these teams would indicate that a release is not imminent. The staffers still need time to get into place and prepare, but that publication of the peace plan could be ready in the coming months. I want to remind you of something that is very important. When the Antichrist comes on the scene, as Daniel chapter 9 declares, that he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. It's talking about a week of years, which is a seven-year peace agreement. When that takes place, I want you to understand that the rapture of the church has already taken place. We are just on the brink of the soon return of Jesus Christ to come back for His church because the Bible says the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Two weeks ago we talked about uh, we, we began the seven seals in the book of Revelation chapter 6 and tonight we're going to continue with the seventh seal and the seven trumpet judgments. In Revelation chapter 7 starting with verse 1, the Bible says, After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the tree, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Assur were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Nephilim were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Isaacon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. I want you to remember these tribes and the 12,000 that were sealed from each of these tribes. It's very important, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Verse number 9. After this I looked and beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. 
Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Throughout the history of the church, we have heard of revivals that have broken out in church after church. We have had revivals break out here at Howe Assembly of God. There have been revivals that broke out in Topeka, Kansas. There were revivals that broke out on Azusa Street in Los Angeles. There were revivals that broke out in Florida. There were revivals that broke out in Arkansas. There were revivals not too long ago that broke out in the northern part of the states. But I have heard the stories of the revivals that have happened. And I've heard the stories of the revivals that have happened here when, when in the old sanctuary when the youth would be praying upstairs. And, and it was before the evening service at 5 o'clock. And the glory of God began to fall in that youth room as they were praying. And people began to... Uh, run down the stairs in that old sanctuary and run into the sanctuary and, and they would run the aisles and people would be weeping and worshiping before the Lord. We've heard of revivals and we've heard the experiences uh, of times past when God has moved. But today we hear so much of a, a coming global revival on this earth that will change the course of human history. But personally, I believe that we have already seen the highlight of spiritual awakenings here in the United States. Never before in the history of our nation has the United States been referred to oftentimes today as a post-Christian nation. This morning I want to tell you about a spiritual awakening that is coming. And it's not only going to affect this nation, but it's going to affect the entire world and it's going to be the biggest revival that ever swept the face of this earth. But it's going to take place after the tribulation. Jesus said in Luke chapter, it's going to take place after the rapture of the church. Jesus said in Luke chapter 18, verse 8, He says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall He find on the earth, shall He find faith on the earth. And the New Living says, When the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? Jesus has given the hint here that when he comes back to this earth, that the amount of faith in people is going to be so low, almost nearly non-existent. It's hard to have a planet-shaking revival if there are few people in this world that have faith. Revelation chapter 7 tells us that a great worldwide revival of souls is going to take place after the rapture of the church. How does it all take place? The Bible tells us that there are going to be 144,000 people that are sealed with the mark of God. And their job is to evangelize this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want us to understand who these 144,000 witnesses, evangelists of the gospel are. There have been several uh, denominations, or as I would refer to them, cults that have declared uh, who they think the 144,000 are. And I'm going to mention some of these by name because I want you to be aware of the truth of what is going on in our generation today. For example, the Seventh-day Adventists apply it to the members of their congregation based on the fact that they will be found observing the Jewish Sabbath at the Lord's return. They believe that they will be raptured when the Lord descends and judgment will be poured out upon the rest of the church. The Jehovah Witnesses teach that 144,000 include only the overcomers of their persuasion of faith who continue faithfully to the end. And besides these, there are many other so-called churches and cults whose leaders consider their own particular followers to be the 144,000 sealed saints of God that take place at the end of the age. All of these denominations and these organizations are overlooking one simple fact concerning the 144,000. If they will read the 7th chapter of Revelation, 
They could learn something very important and save themselves a lot of embarrassment in the end. If you look at Revelation chapter 7, verse 4 through 8, it tells us that 144,000 sealed witnesses, according to Scripture, must be composed of 12,000 Jews from each tribe of the children of Israel. There's not a single mention of Gentile people. Not one single one. In fact, if, if, I'll tell you a story that I heard one pastor say that someone come to his house and, and claim to be one of the 144,000 witnesses of the gospel. And he asked him, he said, if that's the case, tell me which uh, tribe of Israel do you come from? They were clueless. They didn't have an idea what he was talking about. It's because they're taught so much false doctrines in their church, they haven't got a clue what the truth is. That's why it's important that we get into the Word of God. As we preach this morning, if you continue in my Word, then you're my disciple. How do we continue in the Word? We read His Word. We understand His Word. We hide His Word in our heart so that we might not sin against God. So if we look into the Word of God in Revelation chapter 7, it tells us that these 144,000 witnesses are Jews. And verse 4 says that they are from all the tribes of Israel. Now some people will read that scripture and they will ask the question, what do you suppose that means? Let me give you a hint. It means exactly what it says. It means that they are 144,000 Jewish people taken 12,000 Jews from the 12 tribes of Israel. See, they're going to be servants of Jesus Christ. And right away, we become aware of the fact that there are going to be multitudes of people who miss the rapture, but somehow because of these 144,000 Jewish witnesses of the gospel, these people will come to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ during this perilous time of tribulation on this earth. But once again, I want you to understand something very carefully. Some people say, well, I'll, I'll do whatever I want to do now, and then I'll live for God during the tribulation. If you cannot live for God now, when things are easy, if you cannot live for God now, when the restraining power of the Holy Spirit is still here on this earth, how in this world do you expect to live for God when the restraining power of the Holy Spirit is taken away from this world and hell on earth literally comes into existence? And if you are caught being a Christian, you're going to be killed instantly. No questions asked. Will you have the courage and the faith to stand up for God during that time? Don't wait until it's too late. See, the angels that God has sent to bring destruction upon this earth are first commanded by God to wait until 144,000 have been sealed and protected. This verse tells us in Revelation chapter 3, it says, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. This verse clearly tells us that God is intending to hurt the earth. He is going to bring judgment upon this world. He's going to uh, destroy the trees. He's going to destroy vegetation. He's going to destroy the water supply. He's going to destroy the food supply. But He's not going to allow any of that destruction to take place until first 144,000 Jewish witnesses who will evangelize millions for Christ until they have been sealed with the mark of God. They're going to be sealed to let... Satan know that they cannot touch these people. He cannot touch them. They are earmarked for God. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 14 through 18, it also teaches us that the followers of the Antichrist are going to receive a mark. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 14, He deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Let me stop right there for just a second. I want to... I want to give you a, a perspective on what is talking about the image of the beast. 
In order for the Antichrist to be able to speak the, to the entire world, something major had to happen in this world as far as technology is concerned. The only way that our president can address the United States collectively is when he goes on television. What is a television picture? A picture is an image. An image that speaks. An image that has life in it. An image that, that is able to present a communication to you. So, if you cannot come and bow down in front of the Antichrist personally, then the thing is, he will go on television and he will have his presence known all across this world and people all around this world will be able to see him and hear him all at the same time. See, it's, it's interesting times that we're living in today. 200 years ago, 150 years ago, an image that speaks, an image that has life in it. People were clueless to what something like that would mean. Verse 16, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and on their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that have understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. That is six hundred and sixty-six. Once a person takes the mark of the Antichrist, that mark is permanent. It cannot be removed. Whether if it is a computer chip or some kind of a physical mark, or it could be a, a computer scan of your fingerprints or thumbprint, handprint, it could be a digital image of your eye. Whatever it is, you will not have to carry any form of identification. You will not have to carry any cash, any bank cards. Everything is going to be placed digitally on your hand or in your forehead. And without that, you cannot buy or sell anything. Without that, you cannot live. In order to, to become identified as a citizen of the world and to, to proclaim your allegiance to the Antichrist, you must receive this mark that the book of Revelation is talking about. If you receive that mark, then you have marked yourself for eternal damnation and hell. You become a Christian, you get killed by the Antichrist. You receive the mark, you spend eternity in hell. That's why I say don't wait until it's too late to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In Revelation chapter 6 verse 9 through 11 the Bible says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altars the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants and their brethren should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. There will be people that are saved in the tribulation time. The word of God explains it. But those people who are saved in the tribulation once they get caught and found out about their relationship with Jesus, they will be killed. They will be martyred for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, here is a question that I want us to understand. A lot of people have asked, will the Holy Spirit be gone from the earth following the rapture of the church? Let me make something very clear to you. No man can come to the Father except to be drawn by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be present on this earth during the seven-year tribulation. However, I'm going to show you in the Word of God the Holy Spirit's restraining power against the evil forces of darkness. That is going to be lifted away. If you look in your Bible in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5 through 12, I'm going to read this from the New Living Translation to make it a little more simple to understand. This is speaking of the coming of the Antichrist. Verse 5 says, Don't you remember that I told you about all of this when I was with you? And you know what is holding him back, speaking of the Antichrist. For he can be revealed only when his time comes. 
For this lawlessness is already at work secretly, and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed. But the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. This man will come to do the works of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on the way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. So God will cause them to be greatly deceived and they will believe these lies. Then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. The ministry of the Holy Spirit that will be taken away from this earth during the tribulation is His restraining force on this earth. His convicting presence will still remain as lost people cry out for the rocks and the hills to fall upon them. Joel wrote about this time in Joel chapter 2 verse 28 through 32. It says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and upon the servants and upon the handmaids, in those days I will pour out of my Spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. This section, or this section in part, has already been fulfilled. And revivals that has been breaking out through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and this generation in which we are living today where the Holy Spirit is being poured out. Verse 31 says, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said and in the remnant of whom the Lord shall call. This remnant that is talking about here, the remnant that the Lord our God shall call is 144,000 Jewish evangelists that will preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. These tribulation saints who refuse to take the Antichrist mark, this is the one that the song that Brother Morgan sung about this morning. These are they who have come out of great tribulation, who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Can you imagine living in a major city in the United States without any law enforcement, without any laws, without any government whatsoever? Imagine driving down the highway with no traffic laws. No law to tell you what side of the road to drive on. No law to tell you how fast or slow you can go. Anything goes. That's exactly the way it's going to be in life here on this earth once the rapture takes place because the restraining power of the Holy Spirit that holds back the forces of hell is going to be lifted from this earth and Satan is going to be unleashed on this earth to control and to, to uh, bring about destruction upon this world. Imagine a life where the powers of darkness are no longer hindered. No longer will evil be held back. Anything's possible. And so the combination of the anointed ministry of the 144,000 Jewish witnesses in this time of tribulation will result in a harvest of souls for Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 7 verse 9, the Bible says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. It's exciting to think about the fact that there will still be people saved on this earth during this time of evangelism of the 144,000. And it is quite possible that it's going to be a bigger result of souls that are saved than any other time in history. Let me give you a reason why. See, at this time, there were probably 25 to 30,000 evangelists and missionaries around the world. Compare that to the 144,000 spirit-filled, anointed missionaries that God is going to anoint and send out around this world. But in the midst of their ministry, they're going to be ministering in, in the middle of chaos around this world with earthquakes and famines and wars. 
and catastrophic floods and so forth. We've never seen anything in this world of this type of magnitude in all of human history. You will not want to miss the rapture of the church and be left behind to face this terrible time to come. See, the tribulation saints are going to receive rewards of heaven, just like you and I. When we are raptured, at the rapture of the church, we will be standing around the throne of God, crowned with the crown of righteousness, robed in spotless white. These tribulation saints will be worshiping God before the throne in heaven. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 15, it says, Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve Him day and night in His temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. I cannot find any distinction of the rewards of heaven between the dead in Christ and we who are alive and remain and the tribulation saints. God is no respecter of persons. Anyone who is saved by the shed blood of Jesus Christ receives the full benefit of His glory and power. When we stand before the throne of God, we will all be crowned with the crown of righteousness and robed in white. The Bible says that these tribulation saints will receive from God everything that they need. Revelation 7, verse 16 through 17. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of water. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. You see, this is the fascinating point. The Bible says that God is going to wipe away all tears from their eyes. Anything in the history of this world that could ever bring sadness, anything that could ever bring sorrow into our life, God is going to wipe away the tears from our eyes. He is going to wipe away those memories of sorrow. He is going to wipe away those memories of sadness. Anything on this earth that would bring sadness in our life, God is going to remove it. From our memory, never to be brought up again. What a day that's going to be when there'll be no more sorrow, no more sadness. I, I personally believe that if there's no sorrow or sadness, that must mean that the memory of all of that is gone. So the former things are passed away. It's gone. It's never to be remembered again. See, we must choose Christ or reject Him. You can't be halfway in or halfway out. Whether if you follow Jesus Christ in this life now or if, if someone who is saved during the tribulation, they must make a decision. They must live for Jesus Christ. Otherwise, the, the, the punishment for sin is death. It's eternal damnation in the pits of hell. We must understand that God is serious about sin when He says that the wages of sin is death. So this brings us to the seventh seal. In the beginning of the trumpet judgments. In Revelation chapter 6, the Bible lists the first six seals of the scroll of divine judgment. In Revelation chapter 7, we see of the, the 144,000 Jewish witnesses. And when we get to Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, the atmosphere completely changes in the entire universe. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1 says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Imagine this for just a second. We've just been raptured. Hundreds of thousands and millions of people gathered around the throne of God, singing praises unto Him and bowing down before the throne, casting our crowns at His feet and saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive blessing and honor and power. And all of a sudden, He's breaking the sixth the first six seals and we're still rejoicing and all of a sudden he breaks the seventh seal. Everyone stops. The music stops. The singing stops. Total silence for half an hour. Can you remember what it was like on September 11th, 2001 when the planes that were hijacked hit the World Trade Center towers and the Pentagon and one plane went down in the, the fields of Pennsylvania. Everyone was in wonder. And they wondered what was fixing to take place next. I remember at that time I was a cashier at Walmart. And it was on a Tuesday, 
Tuesday night, I believe it was. This is in September. School has just started. Most of the time, Walmart is in total chaos that time of the year. People are still buying school supplies. It's a Tuesday night. People are getting off work. We had four registers open and not one single person was shopping in that store that night. All you could hear was the news playing. Fox News was playing in the store and that's all you could hear. You could not hear anyone and they're shopping. You could not hear anybody talking. All you could hear was the news of what was taking place that day. There's going to be silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. The worship stops. The singing stops. It's replaced by silence. Because we are about to learn from Jesus Christ Himself what is about to happen on earth when the trumpet judgments began and when the seventh seal is broken. And when that takes place, it is going to make 9-11 and Pearl Harbor and Hiroshima look like nothing more than just a Sunday picnic. Because the horrors that are about to be inflicted on this planet by God Himself are so horrific and so horrifying that even the angels in heaven have stopped and they could not say one single word. They were breathless before the throne of God. I just want to remind you tonight, God is serious about sin. He will bring judgment upon this world. He will bring judgment against sin if you are not ready. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1 through 13. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God, out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared to themselves to sound. The first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of the trees was burnt up and all the green grass was burned up. And the second angel sounded as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the angel and the third angel sounded and there fell a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten. And the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. In the New Living Translation, verse 13 says, Terror, terror, terror to all who belong on this world because of what will happen when the last three angels blow their trumpets. Have you ever wondered what happens to our prayers that seem to go unanswered? We find out when this first trumpet sounds. God answers prayers of the praying saints, believing and praying for relief from persecution. And all at once, all of these prayers, all throughout the 2,000 years of the history of the church, all of these prayers are going to be answered with one fatal blow to this earth when God sends the power of prayer down to this earth to bring destruction. See, every time we pray, every time we pray to the Lord, our prayers immediately ascend to the throne of God. 
Revelation chapter 8 verse 4 describes our prayers as being at God's throne. And an angel is standing at the altar before the throne of God with an incense burner. This incense is mixed with the prayers of God's people. And the smoke of this incense mixed with the prayers of God's people ascended up to God. And once these prayers are poured out of this incense burner, the Bible says that the angel will fill these incense burners with fire from the altar before the throne of God. And suddenly he throws it down to this earth. Just of the prayers of God, yeah, of the saints of God have been, no, been noticed by God. The persecution of the church has been noticed. And God is going to bring judgment upon this world for the persecution against His church. The angel begins to blow the first trumpet, signaling a declaration of war. The power of God is going to be brought forth against this wicked world. And with the sounding of this first trumpet, the Bible says that there will be hail and fire mixed with blood. It's going to be thrown down to the earth as an apocalyptic series of events begin to unfold with fire and fury, such as what this world has never experienced in its history. Now there are four things that take place at the sounding of this first trumpet. First of all, the Bible says there is going to be hail and fire mixed with blood. It's going to be thrown down to the earth. When that takes place, it's going to bring with it several results. First of all, the Bible says one third of the earth is going to be burned up. One third of the trees are burned up. And then it also says all of the grass is burned up. Imagine that. We've seen grass fires. We've seen forest fires. One third of every bit of the plant. One third of the forest. One third. And then all of the grass on this planet is burned up. Let me explain this to you. When it says one third of the earth becomes instantly uninhabitable. Let me show you how much land one third of the earth is. It's the size of the continents of North and South America and the continent of Australia. You put all of that together, you have one third of the known world that instantly becomes uninhabitable. Also keep in mind that there is one more continent that already is uninhabitable, Antarctica, because it's too cold. That also counts for another 9% of the earth, bringing the total to over 40% of this earth no longer able to support life in any way. One third of the earth is burned up. Creation is affected in a dramatic way. See, every blade of green grass is burned up. Millions of acres of forest land and, and, and farmland is no longer in existence. One third of the earth becomes nothing but a barren wasteland. That brings us to the second chunk. Revelation chapter 8, verse 8 through 9. And the second angel sounded. And as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. Verse 8 and 9 describe the judgments when the second trumpet sounds. A large mountain of fire, as the word of God says, is going to be thrown into the sea. It's quite possible that this could be like a massive meteorite that crashes into the Mediterranean Sea. And it's obviously a massive meteorite because verse 9 says that when it takes place and when it crashes into the sea, that one third of the creatures in the sea will die and one third of the ships in that sea will be destroyed. As it crashes into the sea, it will create a tsunami like you have never seen before, that will destroy life in that sea, and it will sink one-third of the ships. I want you to keep in mind that during that time, the United States, Russia, Israel, and several other nations of this world will have ships and vessels all across the Mediterranean Sea preparing for battle in the Middle East. And the Word of God is clear that one-third of those ships will instantly be destroyed when that mountain of fire crashes into the sea. And the Bible goes on to tell us that as a result of all of this death and destruction, that the water becomes like blood, which makes it toxic and unsafe for people to drink. 
And the third trumpet judgment in verses 10 and 11, the Bible describes the third judgment. And at this trumpet sounding, another meteor or a star that is called the Word of God, a, a great star falls from heaven that is called Wormwood. And the scripture calls it blazing like a torch that falls from heaven into earth's water sources. And the Bible says that one third of the fresh water in this earth immediately becomes unsafe for drinking. The fourth trumpet sounds in Revelation Chapter 8, verse 12, the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was smitten in the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened and the day shone not for a third part of it and the night likewise. The Bible tells us that on the first day of creation, God said, let there be light and there was light. In Genesis chapter 1 and 3, God is the source of light. But on this <coughs> On this fourth trumpet, he's going to remove this light. He's going to remove one third of this light. And from that time on, there will be more darkness on the earth than there will be light. Now, as bad as the first four trumpets sound, I want you to pay close attention to this warning as an angel begins to hover in the air, sending a warning to the inhabitants of the earth. In Revelation chapter 8, verse 13, the Bible says, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. In the New Living Translation, it explains to us that, that terror is coming to everyone who belongs to this world because of what will happen when the last three angels blow their trumpets. These tribulation woes increase dramatically. And this is only the beginning parts of the tribulation and the introduction to the fifth and the sixth and seventh trumpet judgments. If you have ever heard the expression or the saying, hell on earth, this is going to be that coming to pass. Anything is going to be possible. And so it brings us to the fifth trumpet. Revelation chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven into the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. I want you to look at that verse right there for just a second. Verse number six where it says in those days men shall seek death and shall not find it. Only God can control when our soul leaves our body. People are going to be doing everything they can to try to kill themselves. They're going to be slitting their wrist. They're going to be trying to hang themselves. They're going to try to shoot themselves. Death will flee from them. They can do everything they can do to try to bring death into their body. But God will not allow it. It says they will seek death and will not be able to find it. Death is going to flee from them. Talk about suffering and pain and agony, such as what people in this world have never experienced before. And there will be no cure for it because unless they have received the mark, they cannot receive any medical help. And if they have rejected the mark, if they have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life, they're not even going to be here to begin with. They're going to be killed for their faith. It says they shall seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Verse 7. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses, prepared unto battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, 
and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots, of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. But in the Greek tongue, his name is Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day, and a month and a year, for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand. That is two hundred thousand plus three more zeros. That equals... 200 million, an army of 200 million, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses and the vision, and them that sat on them, having the breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouth issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and the smoke by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents and had heads and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders nor of their sorceries nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. What is it going to take to get people to turn around and repent of their sins? All of this destruction, all of this sorrow, all of this chaos and the torture that was being brought upon this world, still people refused to receive Jesus Christ into their life. In the beginning, when God created this world, everything was perfect. It wasn't until Lucifer the angel rebelled against God and, and many other angels rebelled along with them and were cast out into hell. And many of these angels have been chained in bondage in the pits of hell waiting for a time of judgment. And when this fifth trumpet sounds, an angel from heaven will open the bottomless pit to hell where fallen angels have been kept since Lucifer tried to rise above the throne of God. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, the Bible says God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved and to judgment. So in Revelation chapter 9, verse 3, the Bible says there came out of the smoke locust upon the earth and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. These creatures are going to be out to destroy mankind. Revelation 9, verse 7 through 9 describes these demonic creatures that they are like horses prepared for battle. And for five months, these creatures are going to be stinging human beings that are still here on earth. And verse 6 speaks of the intense pain. Pain that is so intense, but yet it will be impossible to die. In the sixth trumpet judgment in Revelation chapter 9, verse 13 through 15, the Bible says, The sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. The Bible says that there are four angels that are going to be released on this earth who kill one-third of the remaining human beings that are here on this earth. Apparently, they are from the Middle East because the Bible gives reference to the Euphrates River. And they are going to bring with them a massive army of 200 million soldiers. Are they human or are they inhuman? I don't know, but what we do know is this, that they're going to kill 
a lot of people and bring a lot of destruction upon this earth. When we looked at the breaking of the first few seals and we got to the point of the fourth horseman of the, of the apocalypse, the Bible tells us that one-fourth of the world's population is going to be killed. Right now, statistics show that our world's population stands at 7.4, 7.5 billion people. Take away one quarter of that population and now you are left with 5.5 billion people in this world. During the sixth trumpet judgment, another one-third of the total world population will be killed, which brings our world population down to 3.73 billion. And the resulting casualties so far in the tribulation that we have seen based on current population statistics comes to about 3.7 trillion, excuse me, 3.7 billion people that will perish in the tribulation so far. God is serious when it comes to dealing with with sin. Amen. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You will not want to be here during that time. We're only just in the beginning of looking into what's going to take place of the tribulation and already we have seen such destruction and chaos that is going to be brought about worldwide. In the next couple of weeks we're going to be talking about Two important witnesses as well as the seventh trumpet judgment. The church, we must watch and be ready, for we do not know what hour our Lord is coming. He can come before we leave this place tonight. He can come before we have another opportunity to come together and worship with Him. Jesus Christ is coming soon. I believe He's coming sooner than a lot of people in this world think that He is. I believe he's just about to come to the door and open up the door and tell his church it's time to come on in. It's time to come home. That's why we must be prayed up. We must pack up and start looking up because we're going up in the twinkling of an eye to be with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Lord, we thank you for your love, for your grace and your mercy, Father, for all that you have done. God, let us never take for granted the blood that you shed on the cross for the remission of our sins. Lord, help us to not delay what we can do for you now. But Lord, I pray that you will search our hearts, that you will help us, Lord, to be ready to see you when you come in the clouds of glory. Can we stand together all across the sanctuary? Thank you for watching today. If we have reached you, we would like to hear from you. You can visit us online at howag.com or you can write to us at First Assembly of God, P.O. Box 97, Howe, Oklahoma, 74940. We invite you to worship with us at First Assembly of God, Sunday morning Sunday school at 930, morning worship at 1040. Sunday evenings at 6 and Wednesday evenings at 7. We also invite you to subscribe to our online YouTube channel or visit our Facebook page. We hope that you can join us again soon for another service from First Assembly of God in Howe, Oklahoma.